Hi, this is Pastor Gary, uh, back with you again for Wednesday's Word. It's definitely a pleasure uh, to be able to spend some time with you this evening. And uh, tonight, I'd like to talk about hope and just spend some time um, just really diving into that word hope. You know, because at some point in our lives, uh, we're going to need to be comforted or we're going to find ourselves comforting someone uh, through a struggle, through a trial. For example, right now with COVID-19, uh, you know, a lot is going on in, in, per, in people's lives. Uh, you know, I, I, where do you find comfort? Where can you guide them to find comfort? How do you comfort them? You know, how do you reassure them that God still loves them? Where do you, where do we find hope for ourselves and then for those that we're trying to help? Where do we find hope when our current reality seems hopeless? What assurances can we share with people who are going through these, these trials and, and these tribulations and this is their current reality? What hope can we hold on to or guide them to hold on to? You know, that's a lot of questions to ask or be asked. And so, What's the answer? Well, there's good news and bad news with anything, right? The good news is that Jesus offers that type of hope. Unfortunately, the bad news is that many people never experience the hope found in Jesus. You know, they define hope as a feeling of expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. And as Christians, we do have that hope. We, we, we hope on the fact that, that we have salvation that we have eternal life, that, that Jesus Christ will return. But they put their hope on things. Let me tell you where hope doesn't come from. Hope doesn't come from our circumstances. You might hear some, you might have heard someone say, don't worry, all kids go through a rebellious stage. Don't worry, this is just a temporary downturn in the economy. I'm sure in a few months, the oil prices will go back up. Or, or this, you know, your husband or wife, They'll come back. They know that they have a good thing with you. But what if? What if those things don't work out? What if those things don't happen? Well, at least not the way we want them to. So our circumstances may not improve. In fact, they may get worse. And if our hope is based on the expectations of the, that things are going to get better, then what happens when they don't? Well, then hope disappears. Our world, it just collapses. And it's it's in its and in its place comes depression, comes bitterness, comes anger, comes frustration. If hope comes from our circumstances, then our hope is at the mercy of people, events, and forces that are, are beyond and outside of our control. The second place where, where hope doesn't come from is hope does not come from having a positive attitude or remaining optimistic. Maybe you've heard this. Keep your head up. Think positive thoughts. Look on the bright side. Well, that's that's okay, but the problem with that logic, the problem with that type of thinking, is that self-reliance will only get you so far. It might get you through a bad breakup. It might keep your spirits up while you're unemployed, but it will not get you through months and years of struggle. It can't bear the weight of your struggle. Sooner or later, it's going to collapse. The other problem is that in order to maintain this kind of hopeful attitude, you may become detached from reality. See, there's a fine line between being optimistic and just being in denial. The hope that we need is a lasting hope. The hope that we need that, that, that Jesus offers will never disappoint you. It does not come from circumstances. It does not come from with, within us. I, wanna, I want everybody to turn to Psalm 62.5. And in Psalm 62, 5, uh, the psalmist writes, Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. What this means is that we cannot manufacture hope. We cannot will it into existence. True hope comes from the Lord. So when you feel your hope wavering, the first thing that you need to do is get your focus back onto God. Stop looking around for things to feel hopeful about. Stop focusing on what is happening in your life and get your focus onto God. That's the first thing. Look to God in faith. Begin by looking to him. Seek God in prayer. Ask him to restore your hope. If you've never repented of your sins and asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, 
you must first have a personal relationship with God. So that's where you start is understanding that you're a sinner, that you're lost and that you're going to spend eternity in hell without a personal relationship, without repenting of your sins, asking Jesus to come into your heart. And then that's where you find your hope. The second thing we need to figure out is what is the object of our hope? The ob is the object of our hope, you know, the object of our hope, if it's to be true and lasting, must be God himself. Our greatest desire must be to know him. The psalmist writes in different verses in Psalms 25 that no one whose hope is in you will ever be put to shame. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God, you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Another verse in, in chapter 25 says, May integrity and uprightness protect me because my hope is in you. Now you might be thinking or yelling at your screen right now, Pastor, I'm doing that. I'm putting my hope in God. I'm trusting him to save my marriage. I'm trusting him to provide me uh, with a job. I'm trusting and hoping in him not to get laid off. See, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about conditional hope. See, hoping in God to do something or to give you something because if that's the case, that that's the kind of hope you're holding on to, your hope is not really in God. With this type of thinking, God is not the object of your hope. God is not what you're seeking after. It's He's just a means to the end. Hoping in God means you are seeking him for his own sake. It's not hoping that he'll do something for you in your life. Do you see the difference there? To hope in God is to seek him first rather than his blessings. You see, if your hope is in something you want God to give you, and then, and then you know, if that's your hope, then you will always be disappointed and frustrated. Why? Because either you won't get what you hope for, and you'll be mad at God, or you will get what you hope for, and you'll find out it wasn't what you wanted, or that it didn't work out like you thought it would, and you'll be mad at God. But if your hope is in God and God alone, then you will never be disappointed. Because knowing God never gets old. He will never cease to satisfy. You know, here's the thing. If our hope begins and ends with the things of this world and the things of this life, then we will never be satisfied. Because the hope of the Christian faith is not the same as the American dream. We've all heard that phrase, right? American dream. Uh, it has been defined many different ways. You know, it, it's the land of opportunity, the opportunity to make money, have freedom, that have the, the, the house with the white picket fence, the 2.5 kids, the career, the family. You know, having these and having those things are nice and, and would make for a good life. But the Christian life and, and the Christian is not promised a good life, not at least not here on earth. The promise of the gospel is not good health or a happy marriage or financial success. The hope and promise of the Christian faith is to know God now on earth and eternity in heaven. Our hope must be in God and God alone. And when we stand on this truth, then instead of our relationship with God being a way of getting what we want in this world, the exact opposite happens. Everything in this world, the things, the relationships, the activities, the experiences, everything good or bad becomes a means of helping us to know God, to be closer to God. God becomes the end rather than the means. The idea is not to use God to make our life better. The idea is to use our life to know God more intimately, deeper, have a deeper relationship with him. Through the highs and the lows, through the hills and the valleys, through the trials and the, the, the triumphs and the tri trials, our, go our goal is to know God through his son, Jesus Christ. That's the goal. That's our hope. So if the source of our hope is God and the object of our hope is God, then the content of our hope will be the promises of God. Not what we want, but what he wants to give us. What what he has promised to give us and what God promises in his word 
to give us is a salvation, eternal life, and the return of Jesus Christ. That's where our focus must be. That's the hope of the Christian. Things which have to do with salvation, eternal life, and the return of Christ. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't care about the things of this world. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have any hopes for our lives in this world or for our children. But it's about keeping the main thing the main thing. Our desire is to know God and to experience the things of God. And that should be so great that our, that our hope ought to be fixed on him to such an extent that his promises matter more to us than whether we, we get the things of this world. It's not that we care so little about our present circumstances. It's that we care so much more about what is to come. So the big question, how do we bring these two worlds together? We bring the, these two worlds together by trusting in God's wisdom, his love, and his power. We know that he can do all things. We know that no situation, regardless of how hopeless it appears, are beyond his ability to change. You know, Paul tells us in Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. You see, we can trust our circumstances to him. We can turn and change, he can turn and change them in any way he pleases. But what if he doesn't? What if he chooses not to act? What if he allows the situation to stay the same or even get worse? Then we rest in the knowledge that he is sovereign, that he is in control over all things. And so whether or not our hopes in this life are fulfilled, we can rest on the truth that everything that happens in our life is a part of his perfect and loving plan for us. You know, many of you know the story of my mom. Um, she had a surgery and, and it went bad and she was in the hospital for months with uh, infection, staph, MRSA. And uh, for months she was, was in the hospital. She couldn't come home. And, and at a certain po point in her stay at the hospital, uh, she became nonverbal. And we couldn't, she couldn't communicate with us uh, verbally. And, you know, many nights and, and you know, mornings, days, nights, uh, I'd just be praying, lifting her up for God to heal her. Well, he did. Uh, she went home uh, to be with Jesus. Uh, so she's not struggling anymore. She's not hurting anymore. Now, you know, I prayed to God to heal her, and he did. Uh, I would, uh, you know, I, I, she wasn't able to come home, and, and she's not here now. But I wasn't mad at God, because it was ultimately, it, it's always God's plan. Because through that, my dad was able to have, a, a, to come to know the Lord and have a relationship with him and get saved. And so we, we, we lose perspective sometimes in our hope when we want one thing. And when we don't get it, we get mad. But what we don't see is God is moving in that. See, God used that circumstance for my dad to get closer to him, to know Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. And so now I know that both my parents will be in heaven So three, three short points uh, concerning hope. The first is that God will chasten us if our hope is on temporal things. As Job said in Job 19.10, he breaks me down on every side and I am gone. And he has uprooted my hope like a tree. See, if our hope is fixed on something temporary, he may, God may take it away to direct our hope toward that which is eternal. This is not a punishment but a loving discipline. God wants to bless us with the knowledge of him. So if God seems to be removing the things that you had placed your hopes in, praise God. 
because he's removing the things, the obstacles that are in the way of you having a closer personal relationship with him. So maybe it's time for you to ask yourself if you have truly placed your hope in him and him alone. Are you still putting your hope on the stock market? Are you still putting your hope in the, your job, your bosses? The second thing is, sometimes God allows us to wait in order to test and strengthen our hope. The fact that we do not immediately receive what we hope for doesn't necessarily mean that God has denied it. He may simply be testing us. See, time helps to reveal where, where our heart is. Because unbelief is impatient and it quickly gives up. But faith, it waits and it, pers it, it perseveres. Romans 8, 24 and 25 says this. Hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we, see, what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. The third thing is, the more we follow Christ and walk in obedience to his commands, the stronger our hope will become. If you want to strengthen your hope, then obey Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. 1 John 3.3 3, And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Isaiah 49.23 speaks of the promise of God. Those who hopefully wait for me will not be put to shame. Put your hope in God and in his son Jesus Christ and you will not be disappointed. If you have never put your hope and trust in Jesus, what are you waiting for? If you have stopped putting your hope and trust in Jesus, then it's time for you to look and reflect and, and, and reevaluate where you are, where you are with your walk, and turn back to God. We cannot waste time thinking that we can do it on our own, and our, our hope that our government will fix everything, because people will let you down. Jobs will come and go. The stock market will go up and down. It's only Jesus. That's who we put our hope on. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. I thank you, Father, that we can put our hope on you, Father, and put our trust in you, Father. Father, I thank you that we have this time to, to really get deeper into your word, Father. I thank you that, that through all of this, Father, that people are getting to know you, Father, and rely on you and, and put hope on you, Father, not on the things of this world, Father, but on you, Father. Father, I continue to lift up our first responders, Father, our nurses, our doctors, Father, Father, our, our firefighters, our policemen, Father. Father, I pray for their safety. I pray for their families, Father. I pray for, for those that are going through this uh, illness, Father, the sickness, Father, those that have lost loved ones, those that are dealing with people that, that, are, that are in the hospital, Father, that they can't go see, Father. Father, I, I pray that they seek your face and rest on knowing, Father, that you are ultimately in charge, Father, that your plan is perfect, Father, that your will is perfect, Father. Father, we just ask this all in your precious and son, your, your son's holy name, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I, I do miss y'all and I can't wait to see you. I hope everybody stays safe um, and be sure just to continue to reach out to others and continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Good night and God bless.